intellectual property creation and management for emerging growth technology companies. International Harmonization, GATT TRIPS. This presentation is brought to you by the IP attorneys and professionals at Halsey Intellectual Property Lawyers through the Halsey Intellectual Property Technology and Invention Monitor website. Halsey Intellectual Property Lawyers, IP professionals for entrepreneurship's new golden age. This presentation is part of the Technology and Invention Monitor website's Legal and Business Issues and Instructions resource. Intellectual Property Creation and Management for Emerging Growth Technology Companies. International Harmonization. GATT TRIPS. Let's begin the presentation. Now we're talking about one of the uh, treaties that the World Intellectual Property Organization assists to administer along with those countries that are signatory countries to GATT TRIPS uh, through the World Trade Organization. Trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights agreements, TRIPS, GATT TRIPS. The TRIPS agreement is another one of the new agreements adopted as part of the Uruguay round of general agreement on trades and tariffs that occurred in the mid-1990s. Uh, the rationale for the World Trade Organization adopting rules on intellectual property during that time was to establish minimum standards on rights and enforcement obligations and a, a general recognition that intellectual property was inherent in many goods that were traded and will be traded uh, in the future in the commerce that takes place within, uh, within countries and for which there are trade there are issues and tariff issues that, that pertain. And so that's why the, uh, the Uruguay round of uh, negotiations took up and established the TRIPS agreement and we'll talk in this presentation about some of its constituents. In understanding further the background of the GATT TRIPS agreement, it should be understood that there are long-standing disagreements between developed and developing countries over the value of strict or high intellectual property standards. For example, developing countries uh, tend to see these as benefiting those capable of creating and obtaining the rights, uh, most often foreign parties, over its own consumers. One of the areas that continues to be a problem uh, are, is those countries that experience uh, large caseloads in AIDS or the HIV virus and the concerns that relate to intellectual property rights in pharmaceuticals or drug delivery or medical delivery systems in those countries where uh, it would be advantageous to the people or the countries perceive it would be advantageous to the people to ignore intellectual property rights for the administration of, of drugs by copying the drugs or by copying the uh, procedures for de delivering such medicine. Uh, so that's that in, and the ability in, for example, Russia or China has historically been and, and less so less and less so as time uh, goes on. The value in the hinterlands in Russia or maybe China of taking software that's been developed in Seattle and Microsoft or uh, elsewhere in the United States in Silicon Valley or, or uh, uh, in Europe and copying that software and using it for whatever would be deemed to be an immediately valuable use. One of the things to consider, uh, the, to me the, the concept of software piracy and the issue of the, the, the software piracy that's occurred in China, one thing to consider is up until late, and it still goes on to a considerable degree today, is the understanding that as, as recently as a few years ago, as much as 98% of the software that is, was used in China, and about the same time, five or more years ago, about 95% of the software in Russia was pirated software. Well, you think about, you think about China. China is a country where a significant portion of the manufacturing capacity capability for China is government-owned. And it's in those same government factories 
where a lot of the software piracy had been taking place. Now, was this done on employees' own time, or was this done purely by way of the managers saying, I want to copy this software, or are not the managers part of the government itself? Is in fact, uh, has it been the case that a good bit of the piracy that we experienced in Russia and China, for example, was government sanctioned software piracy? Well, we're finding, as I've mentioned before in earlier modules, we're finding a different way of thinking in China and a different way of thinking in Russia and a different way of thinking in a lot of the developed countries, which uh, begins to track the perception of the developed countries and the establishment of the GATT TRIPS agreement that weak laws that facilitate piracy and, and, and cost the, the creator of holder of the value of, of, of their efforts uh, has a detrimental effect on the economy that creates these intellectual property rights. And actually, in the case of China or, or Russia, these large economies, the disrespect for intellectual property rights in these economies sends a clear message to those who would otherwise develop intellectual property rights, new creations, new technologies, new software, new artistic works, that their rights won't be respected in their economy. I think it has a detrimental effect in saying, well, if you create something of value, then your creation of value will be copied and the government won't recognize the wrong in the copying. Just recently at the University of Texas, we conducted a, a court TV conducted a uh, panel that included a U.S. Senator, a U.S. Congressman, a uh, state Supreme Court Justice, uh, as, as well as entrepreneurs within the technology community and the U.S. Secretary of Commerce, talking about the importance of intellectual property rights to the United States and to the world in general. One of the points that came uh, in association with that is a recognition that within the United States it's estimated that about 5.5 trillion dollars is the value of intellectual property rights in the United States. Well, you think about that, think about the, the benefit the, that would derive from making sure that the value, that number, it's hard to imagine what $5.5 trillion uh, means. How big is that? Well, if you think about it, um, one, one measure of understanding it is that what does, what does $1 billion look like? $1 billion, if you took $1 bills and stacked them on top of each other, not end to end, but if you took $1 billion, $1 bills, they would be the height of the Washington Monument in the United States. $5.5 trillion would be 5,500 Washington Monument size stacks of $1 bills. That's the value of intellectual property rights in the United States. And developed countries such as the United States uh, are contended in going into the CAT TRIPS agreement that these values, these important values, need to be protected. Further, the adoption of the TRIPS agreement appears to have come largely from one side of the dispute, the developed countries. The difficulties implementing the TRIPS agreement raise issue about the limits countries face when they try to adopt high standards of commerce. Going back to, for example, in the earlier module, the barbed wire example uh, of, uh, of Texas. You know, when the barbed wire was introduced to Texas. The earlier ranchers, the people who dealt with, who were taking their herds to and from uh, market in Texas didn't like barbed wire. They had to take different routes in respecting other people's rights. But what barbed wire allowed others to do, those who used it, was fence off their properties and use those properties and not have the herds trespass through their property. And so the, but it wasn't easy. 
and a large portion of the Texas economy didn't appreciate the institution of barbed wire. We were seeing the same type of thing or saw the same type of thing in the discussions leading up to the GATT TRIPS agreement. Now, over time, many countries, particularly those holding the vast majority of intellectual property rights worldwide, were, worldwide were concerned about the limits of the existing IP treaty regimes. For example, there were incomplete membership in the existing international agreements, uh, differing rules on categories of IP rights and exceptions to those rights, exclusions of important categories of goods for IP protection, and differing levels of IP enforcement by different countries. A, a patchwork quilt, and there still is today to some degree in the development. The, and further, that there were different international enforcement regimes, the powers of the World Intellectual Property Organization versus the power of the World Trade Organization. And so with these, with these concerns, the idea, the effort for international harmonization uh, continued to lead up to the Uruguay round and the negotiations themselves. They saw a fierce battle over whether to negotiate a TRIPS agreement and just what it would look like. One example. Uh, that, relied, that related to the development of the TRIPS agreement was a good deal of pressure on the part of the United States in the, in, in the form of aggressive unilateralism. The, under uh, Section 101 of the statute relating to uh, the international commerce, the protection of goods coming into the United States, the U.S. used Section 301 approximately 20 times to pursue com countries for, quote, the unreasonable practice of providing inadequate intellectual property protection, such that prior to 1995, Section 301 that dealt with the, the importation of gray market or black market goods allowed the United States to investigate and to make findings of an unreasonable practice and to threaten and ultimately sanction countries that did not adopt U.S. level standards of intellectual property protection. And in choosing to negotiate over intellectual property rights in the year gray round, developing countries decided, and this is how we got them to the table, the developing countries decided that they preferred an international agreement with specified phase-in obligations, and we'll talk about those obligations in a second, to the uncertainty of being sanctioned by the largest uh, international market in the country, and that of the United States. Well, what happens uh, with the TRIPS agreement is that the TRIPS agreement in its construction, it follows up on the major intellectual property treaties, such as the Paris Convention that relates to the priority dates for patents and trademarks, the international respect that exists with regard to patents and trademarks, the Berne Convention with regard to the creation and the duration of copyright laws. And it carries forth the concepts such as national treatment that are common between IP treaties and the trade law. And the world of international protection of intellectual property rights has the majority treaties, its own international organization, WIPO. We talked about that, the World Intellectual Property Organization, in the previous module, and other treaties to facilitate the registration of intellectual property rights. At this point, GATT had no rules on intellectual property rights, but did envision that contracting parties would adopt such rules become part, and they're becoming part of the World Trade Organization and use, become one of the 183 countries using the World Intellectual Property Organization, accession into the World Intellectual Property Organization. So the, the Gantt TRIPS agreement has certain basic elements. One is identifies specific intellectual property rights to which it pertains. Uh, the, the, it uses as, as its basis uh, the principles of intellectual property protection that have become the general standard of the large uh, developed countries in the world, uh, provisions for the enforcement of intellectual property rights, and the settlement of disputes on intellectual property rights between members of the World Trade Organization, and finally, special transition or uh, accession 
agreements that bring developed and less developed uh, countries into the GATT TRIPS agreement according to a specific timeline. The rights that are covered by the TRIPS agreement include copyright and related rights, such as moral rights, trademarks, service marks, different marks of origin, uh, geographical indications, industrial design, such as the design patent that one can acquire in the United States, patents as to functions and structures, uh, as well as pa plant patents and the like, uh, layout designs uh, that relate to mask works for integrated circuits, and then the protection of undisclosed information, i.e. trade secrets. These are the rights that relate that are covered by the TRIPS agreement. The basic principles of TRIPS, as I've mentioned, include certain minimum standards that countries would sign into and present, make part of their laws, their national laws, relative to intellectual property rights, national treatment of intellectual property rights in those specific areas, uh, most favored nation treatment in the sense that uh, there would be a, a level, a high level of appreciation among the countries who are signatory countries for the GATT TRIPS agreement, and then the Article 8 of the TRIPS provides the principles of the prevention of abuse of intellectual property rights, as well as consistent measures necessary to protect public health and nutrition and to promote public interests in sectors of vital importance to socioeconomic and technological development, such as ways of dealing with the aforementioned uh, serious medical problems that can only be dealt with by patented or protected medical treatments and pharmaceuticals. So ways of dealing with those among the signatory countries of the GATT TRIPS agreement. As it relates to patents in, spe in, in specific, the GATT TRIPS agreement says that patents shall be available for inventions whether products or processes in all fields of technology provided they are new, involve an inventive step, and are capable of industrial application. Well, that arguably includes software, that includes genetic engineering, that includes a lot of areas that uh, up until the GATT TRIPS agreement may not have been as universally accepted as protectable. Now, clearly, as I mentioned before, there are discrepancies between the treatment of business method patents in certain uh, developed countries, such as Australia or the United Kingdom. And the question is, does that or does that not still make them comply with the, the GATT TRIPS agreement? Is a business method a field of technology? We're finding that to be a question of interest, a question of concern, and further the question of, of whether patent protection should cover such ideas as uh, consumer reviews on the internet. Is that, is that a field of technology? Uh, the further, the agreement says that the, that the owner, the, the right receiver in, intellectual, in a patent right, disclose the invention sufficiently clear and to complete to be carried out by a person skilled in the art, not any different from the U.S. standard, and further, that patents shall be available and enjoyable without discrimination as to the place of invention, the field of technology, and whether the products are imported or locally produced. So we're seeing a lot of similarity between the U.S. rights and the statement as to patent protection in the GATT TRIPS agreement. So what does the, the GATT TRIPS agreement do? It applies uh, the principles of most favored nation and national treatment and existing IP treaty rules. Does that. It sets out granting an enforcement obligation of the member states to the World Trade Organization, setting up IP administrative offices, judicial procedures, and such, and establishes the border and internal measures that must be, that must be taken to counter infringement, such as seizures, civil, and tri criminal penalties, and all obligations, here are the phase-in restrictions that I've mentioned, 
All obligations have to be undertaken by certain dates. There's a phase-in system. So for developed countries, uh, these were undertaken and agreed to by January of 2006, which was essentially six months after the establishment of the agreement. Uh, the, in developing countries, between 2000 and 2005, these were uh, brought into and made effective. And uh, I've seen repeatedly throughout this year uh, new steps or new announcement where these developing countries have, in fact, achieved most of their goals. And then in the least developed, next year, uh, these least developed countries who desire to be part of the World Trade Organization and signatory countries to the GATT-TRIPS agreement will uh, go into and comply with these requirements, but they may be extended under the, two, uh, the, the 2000 Doha Declaration until another year if they are, comply with certain filing requirements. Shifting a little bit, let's go into some of the constituent components of the GATT-TRIPS agreement. It consists of four parts. Part, four, part one is general provisions, uh, basic principles that identify the scope of the agreement, the adoption of the existing intellectual property conventions, such as the Berne Convention and the Paris Convention, uh, the uh, patent law treaty and such that already exist, the concept of national treatment of intellectual property rights, and the most favored nation requirement that exists for the uh, that exists for the signatory countries. Part two is in a little more detail and establishes the standards on availability, scope, and use for each of the seven IP rights. Uh, Article 27, for example, deals with patentable subject matter. Uh, 20, the uh, 28 deals with the rights conferred in a patent document. 29, uh, conditions on patent applications, what's required in the, agree in the patent application itself. Uh, Article 30, exceptions to the rights conferred, limitations on patents. Uh, that might be in the better interest of, of, uh, of the signatory countries not to grant. Article 31 deals with other use without uh, authorization, uh, such as compulsory licensing, emergencies in response to anti-competitive issues. Article 32 deals with revocation, failure of of the, the rights that might exist, the basis for invalidation of a right, the, or revocation of a right in the example of, of fraud or some other type of, uh, of, of problem, terms as to the length of validity of a patent, for example, in the United States, uh, as a result of signing onto the GATT-TRIPS agreement the term of the U.S. patent document changed. Prior to GATT trips, a patent was valid for 17 years from the date of issuance of the patent. After GATT trips, beginning in 1995, the, the, the law changed so that the term of the patent became 20 years from the date of filing of the patent application. No matter how long it might take for the patent to issue, uh, of course now those patents that were pending at the time of the law change, they were given the longer of 20 years from the date of filing or 17 years from the date of issue. Those that were uh, filed after the 31st of December of, two, of 1995, essentially all patents filed today, their life is the uh, 20 years from the date of filing. However, there was, uh, has been enacted a Patent Term Restoration Act which provides for, in the United States, the ability to have a 17-year term on a patent if the pendency or the time that a patent is in the patent office exceeds three years through no part of delay on the part of the patent applicant. If the patent applicant delay, if the term delay uh, is greater than three years and part of that is a function of delay on the part of the applicant, then the restoration uh, would, would, would not uh, occur. And if there, there's a calculation that we do 
to make sure that if there is a pendency of longer than three years, then the patent applicant gets no more than three years uh, due to, or the, the, the amount of time, rather, that the patent applicant is at fault for the pendency, the time in the patent office exceeding three years is taken from any type of term restoration that would go to the establishment of a 17-year term. Anyway, there's a little calculus that goes on to make sure that the applicant does, in fact, get at least the 17-year term that he would otherwise have if it weren't for the establishment of the GATT TRIPS agreement. And then Article 34 has to do with process patents, deals with the burden of proof in Section 8, the control of anti-competitive practices in contractual licensing, dealing with certain antitrust or patent misuse considerations that would be of concern in, by the signatory countries. Part 2 further provides uh, in the establishment standards that Article 40 recognizes the link between intellectual property protection and anti-competitive licensing practices and, and gives member states the right to determine what constitutes, here we've got national rights again, uh, what constitutes abuse of intellectual property rights and to ban certain licensing practices as anti-competitive. And this can occur at the state level as opposed to uh, necessarily being part of the treaty. The treaty just makes it possible for these to occur and perhaps having some measure of, of national interpretation of what is in fact anti-competitive behavior. Now, Part 3 deals with obligations of members to provide procedures and remedies for the violation of the intellectual property rights. Uh, part 4 has to do with transitional arrangements into the accession into the GATT TRIPS agreement. And then Part 5 deals with dispute settlement in terms of what uh, occurs in the event of a violation of the GATT TRIPS agreement. This concludes the presentation. Thank you for viewing Intellectual Property Creation and Management for Emerging Growth Technology Companies. International Harmonization, GATT, TRIPS. Be sure to visit us at www.halseyiplaw.com. Halsey Intellectual Property Lawyers, IP Professionals for Entrepreneurship's New Golden Age. This is Bill Halsey.